I'm going to apologize because actually I'm not going to talk about operating theory, theory at all. Uh, in fact, I'm going to be resolutely finite dimensional. And the only thing that, that I'm going to mention that has uh, even, even a hint of operator theory in it is Jordan algebras. But I'm going to be at pains in a moment to tell you that with regard to Jordan algebras, at least as far as I'm going to use them, you need to know almost nothing. And in particular, you don't even need to worry about the Jordan product. So algebra will be invisible. Um, this is really a talk about um, reconstruction of finite dimensional uh, quantum mechanics. Um, there have been, uh, as most of you very well, um, sort of a spate of, of reconstructions of finite dimensional quantum mechanics from various packages of, of reasonably simple operational or, or physically natural um, assumptions. But there, there is room for some discontent or, or some misgivings about, about um, most of these. In particular, they all assume local tomography, that is that the, the joint state of a composite system is completely determined by the probabilities that the state assigns to local measurements of the two wings. And that immediately rules out real and quaternionic quantum mechanics almost by fiat. And so if, you, if you're not completely comfortable simply ruling those out uh, as abruptly as that, then you might have a little bit of hesitation about, about local tomography as an axiom. Um, another thing that they all do, um, and this is a natural thing to do, but it's also a very, very sort of strong thing to do, is to make uh, an assumption in, in one form or another uh, that says that uh, physical systems are determined, that the structure of a system is determined by some, some parameter that you can call its information capacity. Um, one of the things that follows from this is that there can only be one type of bit so one, only one kind of system that, that, that has, uh, so to say, two distinguishable states or one bit's uh, worth of information carrying capacity. And that will, that will certainly rule out uh, any theory in which, for instance, you might try to combine real and quaternionic quantum mechanics in one package, and then you would have the rebit and the quaternionic bit both in your theory, and that wouldn't do according to this axiom. Um, a third thing, I haven't quite listed it here, but I think I'll mention it, is that at least speaking for myself, when I read these papers, um, I, I find myself having to work kind of hard. And I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm a mathematician, which means that I'm sort of congenitally lazy. That's, you know, mathematics is, as I tell my students, the art of being lazy and getting away with it. Um, I, I like to look for simpler proofs if I can find them. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fail to derive um, finite dimensional quantum mechanics. But I'm going to do it from arguably simpler principles and still get pretty close. And I'm going to do so with, all, with what I think is a lot less effort. Um, I'm not going to use local tomography. Uh, the, the result is going to be a, a, a framework that's perfectly compatible, real, or complex, or quaternionic quantum mechanics, or maybe all of them playing together, uh, together with bits of any dimension you like, but not very much more than that, just a teeny bit more than that. Uh, the, the payoff, as, as almost always when you're aiming at a slightly broader target, is that it's easier to hit. So again, the, the, the amount of effort will be less, or at least I'm going to try to persuade you that that's the case. Um, okay, so uh, the outline is roughly this. I'm going to start with some quick background on Jordan algebras, uh, a slightly lengthier little mini tutorial on generalized probabilistic theories, though that will be familiar to many of you. Uh, then the meat of the talk is in the third batch of slides uh, concerning what are called conjugates and, and self-duality, and then a little bit again on filters and homogeneity and sort of completes the picture. Um, okay, so here's everything you need to know about Jordan algebras, at least for present purposes. Um, Jordan algebras <coughs> are also uh, ordered vector spaces. A little jargon. Um, if E is a finite dimensional um, uh, real ordered vector space with a positive tone E plus, um, and, and with a fixed inner product, then you say that E is, I guess this pointer is invisible, yeah, okay. then E is self-dual if um, an element of E that has a positive inner product or a non-negative inner product with everything in the positive cone is in fact in the positive cone and vice versa. So that the cone is in some sense its own dual with respect to this inner product. Another very strong constraint on an ordered uh, vector space is that it be homogeneous. 
This means that the group of order automorphisms in E, order automorphism is just a fancy word for a, a, a linear automorphism that preserves the cone in both directions, that is positive in both directions. Um, if that acts transitively on the interior of the cone, the space is homogenous. Um, there's a, a, a sort of antique but very lovely theorem uh, due to independently due to uh, Kircher and Vinberg, that should be Vinberg, not Vinberg, um, uh, from 1957 and 1961 respectively, um, that characterizes the homogeneous self-dual finite dimensional order vector spaces as formally real Jordan algebras, uh, with positive cone being the cone of squares. The A squared here means A Jordan product. Um, knowing that, uh, there's only one other thing we really need to know, and that's an even more antique result, a very, very famous result, which is the Jordan von neumann wigner classification of formally real Jordan algebras. They are all direct sums of just five simple types. The simple types are real, complex, and quaternionic matrix algebras, which you can regard as models of real, complex, and quaternionic finite dimensional quantum systems. Uh, an exceptional case, the three by three octonionic um, uh, uh, matrices, or the self joint part of that. And then finally, uh, what are called spin factors, which I won't describe in detail, except to say that they are, in effect, uh, bits with um, arbitrary dimension in which the um, state space of the bit is just an n-dimensional Euclidean ball. So generalizations of the block sphere to, to a higher dimension setting. Um, OK, um, a, a natural question then is, if, can we motivate homogeneity and self-duality in reasonably transparent physical or operational or probabilistic terms? A clue to how to do this is, is given by um, looking at the most important case, which is ordinary complex quantum mechanics. So suppose H is a complex Hilbert space of, uh, say, uh, finite dimension n. Suppose your ordered vector space is just the space of Hermitian operators on, uh, on H. It's a nice real vector space. It's ordered in the usual way by the kind of positive operators. This is self-dual with respect to the, the usual trace inner product, or let's use the normalized trace inner product. Okay? It's very easy to check that that makes that code self-dual. Um, now, a, a kind of important clue to what we're going to do in a minute is to notice that the trace inner product, or the normalized trace inner product, viewed correctly, is actually a bipartite state. In other words, it's not just a useful gadget. It's physically meaningful as a state. In fact, it's just the standard maximally entangled state, not on H tensor H, but on H tensor H conjugate. H bar there is the conjugate open space. If you set it up that way, then you can easily check that for any operators, little a and little b, the, uh, the expected value in state psi of a tensor b conjugate is precisely 1 over n times the trace of a b. Now, it's a consequence of the fact that psi generates that, um, the, the normalized trace inner product, or, or something you can check directly, that psi, therefore, at, regarded as a state, sets up a perfect uniform correlation between every basic observable, that is to say, every orthonormal basis on H with its conjugated counterpart. In fact, if you just compute, you see that the, the probability of getting a unit vector X tensor unit vector uh, Y conjugate um, in state psi is 1 over N if X equals Y, and it's 0 if X is orthogonal to Y. So if you measure the same thing on each side, you will get the same result with probability 1 over n. Moreover, psi is uniquely determined by this correlational, this strong correlational feature. It's the only state like this. All right, now we're going to generalize, having, having in view to try to mimic what we just did, but in a totally um, general situation. Uh, there are lots of ways of setting up a sort of a general or generic probabilistic uh, framework, but this is the one I like. A test space is simply a collection of measurements. Uh, I'm going to simplify the mathematics a little bit by identifying every measurement with its outcome set, and therefore this collection script M of measurements is simply a set of sets. It's a hypergraph, but with each block interpreted as the outcome set of some measurement that you can make. Uh, measurement, operation, experiment, I'll call them tests. Sort of if we let 
uh, capital X be the union of all of these uh, outcome sets, a uh, sort of total outcome space for the test space, then a probability weight on M is very naturally defined to be a mapping that uh, assigns to outcomes, real numbers in the unit interval, summing to one over each outcome set. Okay. So let's define a probabilistic model to be a pair that consists of a test space, some catalog of measurements you're allowed to perform, and some designated set of probability weights, possibly not all of them, but some of them that you think are somehow physically pertinent, uh, that you'll call the states of the model. I'm going to take that state space to be convex, uh, to allow the possibility that we might form weighted averages or, or statistical mixtures of states. Um, I'll also adopt this notation. If A is the label of the model, then M of A, X of A, and Omega of A are these chosen test space, total outcome space, and state space. I'm going to make this standing assumption, which is crucial for what we're going to do. Um, this state space has finite affine dimensions. It sits in a finite dimension vector space, or can be so. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Uh, the two important ones are um, the simple the simplest classical model in which you have only one test, say E, only one outcome set, and in which you take for your uh, state space the simplex of all probability weights thereof, no restrictions. That's the sim sim sort of the standard model of elementary statistics 101 probability theory. Uh, the simple quantum uh, model is to start with a finite dimensional Hilbert space H and then let M of H be the set of orthogonal bases for H as a sort of simple model of basic quantum measurements, and take omega of H to be the set of all probability weights induced by density matrices according to the Born rule in that standard way. Um, it's maybe worth remarking that that's actually all the probability weights as long as the dimension of H is bigger than 2, thanks to Gleason's theorem. All right, here uh, are some two-bit, I'm sorry, here are two-bit examples. Um, something I'm going to call the square bit and the diamond bit. They're both bits in the sense that they only offer you the possibility of making two outcome measurements. So you can only sort of store one bit of information in this if you like. Um, the two measurements I'm going to call um, x and, and x prime, x and not x if you like, and y and y prime. These models have that same test space, but they have different state spaces. The state space of uh, the square bit is the set of all the probability weights, and that's clearly just an assignment of a number between 0 and 1 to x, and a number between 0 and 1 to y independently, so you get a square. But we could also restrict the set of states, uh, and a nice way to do that is this. Um, if you think about it, every state along this um, edge of this square is assigning probability 1 to x. We might want to pick, say, the center of, of that edge, the bare center of that base, and say, Let's let that be sort of a privileged state that assigns probability 1 to outcome x. And we'll do that all the, all the way around the square. Choose those privileged states and take the convex hull, and then you get that diamond. And that might be your state space. All right, here are some properties that state spaces, uh, pardon me, that uh, probabilistic models might or might not enjoy. A probabilistic model is uniform if all of its tests have the same size. I'll call that size the rank of the test space. Perfectly reasonable if you think of all of your tests as the result of taking some basic test and then tweaking some physical parameter, turning a knob or changing a current or something like this. Um, I'll say that a test space is sharp if for every outcome there is a unique state in which that outcome has probability 1. That's a strong restriction, but not, not an unreasonable one in some sense, as I'll mention in a minute. Finally, call a, uh, call a probabilistic model spectral if it's sharp. And moreover, every, every state alpha can be decomposed over the outcomes of some test as probability of outcome x times the unique state in which x has probability 1. All right? Now, let's look at some examples. The square bit of a moment ago, that's uniform. There are only two outcomes per test. Rank is 2. But it's, it's not even sharp. So certainly not spectral. The diamond bit, let's just go back for a moment. The diamond bit is sharp because the only state, for instance, that assigns probability 1 to outcome x is this one. I chose it that way. Right? That's, that's been cooked up to be sharp. And I'll mention that 
at least as long as you have a minimal amount of symmetry, um, you can almost always choose your state space to make things sharp just by choosing barest centers of faces of the state space. So in that sense, it's not a very strong restriction. Spectrality is harder to arrange. The diamond bit is not spectral. Again, let's go back and see why not. The diamond bit to be spectral, I need to be able to decompose states as weighted averages of either this pair or this pair. So the only states that have those, de those decompositions are along this line and this line, and that leaves out most of the state space. So that's hardly spectral. On the other hand, the classical and quantum, mechani uh, quantum mechanical models I showed you earlier are spectral, as well as uniform and sharp. OK. Um, given a probabilistic model A, I can assign to it or associate to it two ordered vector spaces, actually a number of ordered vector spaces. But in particular, I can construct this one. I'm going to call it V of A. It's simply the span of the state space as a subset of R to the X of A. Um, R to the X of A, of course, is huge, but by a standing assumption, omega of A is finite dimensional, so V of A is finite dimensional. I'm going to order this by the cone of non-negative scalar multiples of states. So you just take that convex set, and you look at the cone that it generates. That's the positive cone. It's worth remarking that effects are elements of the dual of this space. The dual of this space is an ordered unit space. The, uh, there's an effect algebra sitting in there. But we'll go into that. Um, anyway, the definition of an effect is that it's a linear functional on this space V of A, taking values between 0 and 1 on states in omega of A. Uh, an interesting example, or an interesting, obvious example of an effect is to take a measurement outcome little x and just look at the evaluation functional that, that evaluates uh, to the probability of x in alpha. If you add up all of the evaluation functionals that come from outcomes in a test, you get what we might call the unit effect, the effect that gives you value 1 at every state. Another ordered vector space that we're going to need to use, though it's more of a technical tool than, than perhaps very meaningful in itself, is what I'm going to call E of A. Now, as a vector space, this is basically V of A dual, but it's ordered not by the, the cone that you might first think of, the dual cone, but rather by this cone here. This cone consists of all linear combinations, finite linear combinations, of outcomes, doesn't, doesn't have to be, they don't have to come from the test, they can come from anywhere, with non-negative coefficients. Linear combinations of, of evaluation functionals of outcomes. I need also to talk about joint states. This is standard, but for those of you who haven't seen it, a joint state on uh, two models is just a mapping that assigns a joint probability to pairs of outcomes. The requirements are that the joint probability is sum to one over the Cartesian product of any two uh, tests. And a another condition, which may be a little less obvious, is that if you, if you evaluate uh, this joint state at outcome x, and you regard the result as a function of you know, a not yet evaluated function of, of y, the resulting function of y should be in b plus of b, and similarly on the other side. That condition is there to guarantee two things. First of all, that, um, that you have well-defined marginals. If you sum omega uh, of fill in the dot y, y and f, um, that's independent of f. And that can define that the first marginal of omega. And similarly, on the other side. Um, and then over here, you can define the conditional state. Omega of <coughs> the second system, given outcome x on the first system, is just the joint probability divided by the marginal in the usual way. And similarly, on the, on the other side. Not only, not only are these marginals well defined, which is, by the way, the non-signaling condition, but this condition B guarantees that the marginals are back in the right state space and also the conditional states are in the right state space. Um, the conditional and marginal states are, are nicely related by the, the, the familiar kind of law of total probability. The marginals are weighted averages of the conditional states uh, weighted by the probabilities given by the other, uh, the other marginal, where, um, where again, the sums on the right-hand sides here and here are independent of the 
choice of living is EF. And that turns out to be very powerful. We will, we will use it. Um, a lemma that's useful to know, and it's not very hard to prove, more or less a formality, is that every joint state extends in a unique way to a linear operator, in fact, a positive linear operator, not from V star of A necessarily, but from E of A to V of B. To get this to be positive, you need to use E of A. I think um, that's the main reason to use E. Um, the extension is, 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 again, unique in, in the sense that the operator only a hat, linear hat is a hat, he evaluated it. X hat evaluated at Y is Okay. Now that we have that in infrastructure, we can start to generalize. Uh, earlier we said that uh, the maximally entangled state on H tensor H, H conjugate um, gives you uh, the trace, which then gives you the normalized trace, which gives you the inner product that's self, is self-dualizing for the quantum system. So we're going to start by generalizing this notion of a perfectly correlating, perfectly uniformly correlating bipartite state. So suppose A is uniform, with rank N. I'm going to define a conjugate to A, a conjugate for A rather, to be a triple consisting of another model, A bar, an isomorphism, which I'll call gamma sub A, from A to A bar. I won't tell you what I mean by an isomorphism. It's the obvious thing. Just write it down. Um, and eta sub A is a joint state on A and A bar, such that this is true, such that the probability of seeing X and its counterpart is 1 over N, which, by the way, guarantees, since it is a joint state, that the probability of seeing X and a different value that, is, that, is, that, is, that would come from the same measurement is 0. Um, just to simplify notation from now on, I'm going to write X bar for the image of X. Um, a quick remark also, this condition tells you that the conditional, the conditional probability of x on the first system given measurement out from x bar on the conjugate system must be 1. So if a is sharp, then eta sub a, well, if a is sharp, then this is that unique delta sub x state. And it follows that a, is, that a, is, is, a sub a is actually uniquely determined, in fact, by this formula. Um, that, in other words, there's only one choice for eta sub a. Since the transpose of eta sub a is also going to satisfy these correlation conditions, it means that eta sub a is automatically symmetric. All right, most of what I have to say is packed into this one little lemma. Suppose that a is sharp and spectral, and suppose it has a conjugate. Then eta sub a of little a comma b bar, a and b bar coming from e of a, actually defines an, an inner product and in fact a self-dualizing inner product on A. The proof is very straightforward enough so that I'm comfortable leaving it as an exercise. Since I'm nice, I'll give you some hints. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take very much. I have less than 10 minutes at this point, but I think I'm just going to probably imprudently say a few things. Um, the main thing is just the observation that because of the spectral decomposition of elements in P of A, um, eta hat is going to take, uh, pardon me, uh, uh, the spectral decomposition of elements of E of A, eta hat is going to take uh, E of A plus onto the cone V of A plus. Um, since the dimensions of these two spaces are the same, um, that's enough to make eta hat uh, a linear bijection, but more than that, it also means that the inverse image of, of the co a cone on one side will still be the cone on the other. So it's an order isomorphism. Using the fact that it's an order isomorphism, you can transfer the spectral decomposition from B of A back to E of A so that elements of E of A will all have this sort of nice spectral decomposition. Once you have that, then noticing that eta is bilinear, that's from lemma zero and the sharpness remark before uh, symmetry, uh, but in particular because of bilinearity, AA is just going to be coefficient Tx times coefficient Ty uh, A to xy bar for arbitrary choices of xy. Cross e, but eta of xy is going to be 0 unless x equals y, in which case it's going to be 1 over n. So here you go, you have that. That's not negative. In fact, it's not 0 unless, unless a is 0, and that's, that's the bulk of the argument. There are some nice corollaries to this. Um, you can prove a spectral uniqueness theorem with this much. Um, given a spectral uniqueness theorem, a sort of preferred way to decompose things in E of a, you also have a functional calculus, which is applied function 
coefficients and the unique decomposition. You've got f of a. Um, another corollary that surprised me a little bit is that this is already enough to prove that if m of a has rank 2, all the other assumptions of lemma 1 in force, then the state space of omega of a has to be a Euclidean ball. So already you have spin factors. To complete the picture, we need homogeneity. <laughs> I'm keeping you two in Chris. <laughs> you need homogeneity, and um, yeah, just about right, actually. Uh, you need homogeneity, and to get homogeneity, I'm going to have to talk about processes. By a process from A to B, I mean a positive linear mapping that takes the, so to say, state space B of A to, to B of B. I want it to be normalization, uh, non-increasing. Um, so the, the unit effect of B evaluated on the process tau evaluated at state alpha should be less than or equal to 1. You can regard that quantity uh, U, B, so U, U of B, U sub B tau of alpha to be a probability for the process to fail. So this allows for lossy processes, processes that sometimes just don't work. Um, I'm going to say that a process is reversible. Maybe I should say probabilistically reversible if there's a, another process that undoes it with some with some non-zero probability, um, which incidentally implies that as a linear mapping, tau has to be an order automorphism. There's a particular kind of um, process that's particularly interesting. It shows up in quantum mechanics. It's what I like to call a filter. If you have a test E in M of A, then I'll say that a process of mapping from V A to V A is a filter for, for E. If for every outcome of E, there is some coefficient, some non-negative coefficient, t sub x, so that the probability of seeing x in phi of alpha is the probability of seeing x in alpha times this attenuating coefficient, t sub x. And I think I've actually, there's a bit of an error in the slide. It should say not only t of x is greater than zero, it should say t of x is between zero and one. So these coefficients should decrease, if you like, the response of each outcome in the test independently. If you think of the test as an array of detectors, then you can think of this as something that just sort of tunes down independently the, the sensitivity of the detectors. Now, this actually shows up in, in quantum mechanics in a pretty nifty way. You imagine some sort of stern gear lock like apparatus, uh, prepare a system in state alpha, measuring x, y, z, which of these channels shows up, and Ordinarily, you can get x with probability alpha of x, y with probability alpha of y, and this should say alpha of z here, so the probability alpha of z. But if you apply a suitable filter to alpha, you might find that this outcome only shows up with probability one half of what it should. So the, the sensitivity of that outcome has been reduced by a half. That's the typical, typical sort of effect of a, of a filter. What do they look like in quantum mechanics? They're basically pure um, CP maps. They're the pure CP maps associated with density operators. You have a density operator W, and you look at the CP map that takes operator A to square root of W, A square root of W. That's a filter for any eigenbasis of W. All right, we put the lemma together with the Coker-Vinberg Co theorem. We have this theorem. In view of, if the hypotheses of lemma one hold, then having arbitrary reversible filters and being homogeneous, uh, V of A being homogeneous and E of A being a formally real Jordan algebra are equivalent. This actually characterizes formally real Jordan algebras. The only remaining sort of uh, unhappiness maybe is to ask what about spectrality? That's a pretty strong condition. Actually, you can get it for, for cheap or less. If you call a joint state correlating, if there's some test in A and some test, say F in some other system B, and a partial bijection between them uh, on which omega is supported, uh, at least on E cross F, so that the probability of getting X and Y from E and, and F is only positive if X and Y are related by this partial bijection. If, if that's what it means for a state to be correlating, then if A is sharp and omega is uh, correlating, then its marginal will be spectral. Therefore, if you assume that every state dilates to, if every state is the marginal of a correlating state, then every state is spectral. This correlation postulate is in some sense um, at least morally similar to the uh, purification postulate, but without requiring purity. 
Um, I'm pretty much out of time, so I'll skip that slide, and I'll put a few conclusions up there for you to look at if you want. I'm done. Thank you. So your, so your theory is causal because there's this unique uh, unit effect. Mm -hmm. So why then do you require no signaling for the joint by tardive probability distribution? Isn't uh, that implied by causality in this case? Um, actually, I go the other way around. I get the... Um, no, actually, let me take the back. I think, this, I think the shorter answer is no. It's not implied. Ah. Um, why then? It's not implied because the existence of the unit effect is um, is simply coming from the fact that um, that my states add up to one over all the measurements. That's all. That and, um, and the finite dimensionality. You could do this more generally just by assuming the state space is compact, and you would still get this unit effect. That's just that's just automatic, and it doesn't require, as far as I can tell, any separate causality action. Um, I, I confess I've always been a little bit puzzled by this this way of getting the, the unit effect when it seems to come out uh, more or less automatically without explicitly assuming anything like causality. Um, but as I understand it, causality is no signaling from the future. And um, I want my sort of correlating state eta alpha, uh, eta a, I want that to be no signaling in either direction. So I would need to assume no signaling. Yeah, but if your, if your measurement, in, when you apply this measurement on your bipartite state, it is both sum to the deterministic effect then. Essentially, you're not able to run. So you just well, another, another way to say it is that they would both some deterministic effect. But one thing that I, I deliberately resisted doing here uh -huh. was talking about composite systems. I, I don't know if you caught that, but I was trying just to talk about joint states and not talking, but not talk at all about what sort of models they were joint states of. So I'm not committed to any particular model of composites here. Yes. Just at least not for, for this much. Let's thank Alex for last time.